So I, I don't want to see this as just an environmental topic over here that we need to stay positive about. This, if you, if, if you recognise that modern societies are breaking down, then that is a fundamental condemnation of the entire culture and systems that destroyed life on Earth and fucked everything up. And therefore we should be angry, and therefore we should hit despair, and therefore we can emerge in a new way. My name is Becca DeKinney. I'm a proud First Nations Australian woman. And I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, waters, sky, and country on which I meet with you today. The Iroquois people of Bundjalung country. And I also honor the Githabal and the Jimbal peoples of these lands as well. I pay my, my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and all First Nations peoples here today. So it's my honour to introduce you to our guest this evening, starting with Jem Bendel. Jem Bendel is a professor of sustainability leadership and the founder of the Initiative for Leadership and Sustainability at the University of Cumbria. He's also the founder of the Deep Adaptation Forum and Movement and the co-founder of the International Scholars' Warning on Societal Disruption and Collapse. Jem is most famous, or should I say infamous, for his paper written in 2018, Deep Adaptation, which has now had mil millions of views and downloads globally. He was named Head Doomster in GQ magazine <laughs> in 2023, which you'll realise why that is soon. The same year he launched his book, Breaking Together, which is the name of this evening's event, which I recommend you all read if you haven't already, and we do have some of those available in the foyer. Other accolades of the past include being a committed environmentalist and activist from a very young age, working at the WWF, he was a young leader at the World Economic Forum, and spoke at the launch of the UK Extinction Rebellion movement, and also was recognised as a young global leader at the United Nations. He's now living in Bali and focused on the development of a regenerative farm school called Vikanze, as well as continuing to teach and speak in select locations globally, online and in person. Yeah. And here. <laughs> the Deep Adaptation paper published in 2018 by Jim actually changed my life and rushed me into a personal, rapid process of coming to terms with collapse, which very much influences everything I do today. We're extremely lucky to have him here with us tonight as things start to amplify for us around the globe with the collapse. And we're very lucky to have him on the stage tonight with Michael Shaw, who you probably all know, amazing local filmmaker, and hopefully you've seen his film as well, Living in the Time of Dying. Over to you, Michael. Michael will be leading the Q&A this evening, and I hope you all enjoy the proceedings. Thank you. So, Jim, uh, just to kick this off, I first come to you also via the paper Deep Adaptation. And I was also sort of shocked, I had, shouldn't have been shocked, but that you made the obvious leap between what's going on in the climate, the, the climate collapse, and civilization collapse. Back then you said civilizational collapse was inevitable. In the book that you've written, Breaking Together, uh, you, you no longer say it's inevitable because you say it's already happening. And I'm wondering what you, in the research you did for this book, uh, and you took a significant time out to do that with the team, what did you see uh, that led you to say that it's already happening, not just that it's inevitable where it started. Yeah, hello everyone. And uh, thank you for the invitation, Michael, and for organising this. Um, yeah, straight in with a technical question. Um, why do I think that the collapse of modern industrial consumer societies has already begun? A first thing to say then would be, you know, I'm a, I'm a recovering academic, so I do remember that we should define our terms. 
So for me, a societal collapse is an uneven ending of normal modes of sustenance, shelter, uh, entertainment, meaning making, travel, you know, and an ending. So the crucial thing is the ending. So, <clears throat> and within that field of scholarship, looking at like ancient civilizations, past civilizations, then the, the specialists in that like to say that it, it constitutes a collapse if it's all of that's broken down for at least a generation before things start to emerge again in a different way. So that's so it's a, a crucial, therefore, is that it's a, a process. And I think when I wrote the deep adaptation paper, I had a an implicit assumption that collapse is like a sudden event, like a building falling down suddenly, or a person falling over suddenly, rather than an unfolding process. So, therefore, I assumed that it had to be at some point in the future, because there I was still, you know, the ATM still worked, the supermarkets were still full, I was still able to be typing away on my computer. But then, so that, that, was, that was important, just that shift in understanding that collapse, even if it is rapid in terms of uh, a time frame such as the history span, the, the, the lifespan of a civilization, or even longer time frames, ecological or geological, um, it's still a process. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, um, I started to look at data that was far broader than just what was happening with climate change. So for the research for this book, I looked at um, more broad biophysical indicators. So what's happening with habitat loss, biodiversity loss, soil degradation, water table uh, 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 drying up, and desertification. I looked, at, um, I looked at the question of whether we could have um, a transition off fossil fuels onto... Uh, other forms of energy and electrify all of society for everyone right now, but also the billions who are not yet participating in modern industrial consumer life. Um, I looked at what's happening with the food system more closely as well. So when I did all that, it started to look a lot worse than what I had realized. And then, really surprised me, I thought at that point, well, I better look at the big statistics. Like, what are the, the statistics that tell us about the state of the planet for, for humans, for how we experience? So, statistics about life expectancy, about education levels, about well being, um, and disease levels. And one of the main ones launched in the early 90s by the UN is the Human Development Index. And I discovered that. Actually, in 80% of countries worldwide, so on all, all populated continents, it had been going down since 2019. And then when I looked into it more in the footnotes, a lot of that data that goes into that index is two years old at the time of publishing. So it was indicating at least by 2017, things were getting worse for people around the whole planet, 80% of countries. And that index had been improving for OECD countries, so the rich club of countries, um, like uh, here, um, every year uh, until just the last few years, since 2019, and it had been going down in the majority of OECD countries. I think, in fact, 90% of OECD countries have been going down since 2019. So this is pre-pandemic. And the fact that it's happening everywhere means you can't just blame it on that politician you don't like, or an unnecessary war, um, or a particular bad luck with fires or floods or whatever. This is happening nearly everywhere, consistently, year on year, um, since about 2017. So then I look closer, and there are other data sets, like the Numbio Quality of Life Index, which um, compiles different data sets but about how we're experiencing life. And um, I realized that had actually plateaued globally apart from in Africa since 2016 and then had started going down. So although 
suppose two things to say on that. The first one is, most of us here tonight are, in relative terms, incredibly privileged, myself included. And so what we experience is bad news on TV, one or two really terrible but sporadic disruptions to our life because of a fire or a flood. R rising prices which don't just um, make it more difficult to save money or take a holiday, but do on some level at the pace of the rise of prices do make, give a, a little bit of anxiety, but we can still cope. But for so many people, these data sets I'm talking about, that's actually people going hungry, people having to migrate, to force, being forced to move, people having to cope with spiraling crime rates, people not getting access to necessary medical care. So this is, this is, um, yeah, this is how we, we can frame this either as just disruptions that for some reason are happening everywhere on an ongoing basis. We can frame it as decline but my conclusion from analyzing the foundations of modern societies is that these cracks on the surface I've described are just going to get worse. These are trends that will continue. Climate change is one multiplier of stressor of all the problems, which is getting scarily worse over the last 12 months globally. Um, so I feel that framing it as societal collapse is a very plausible view and it invites us to really think, rethink everything. And for some people that's a very powerful transformative reframing of a lot of ongoing bad news and increasing difficulty in their own lives. So, um, so maybe I was going to say other things and I've forgotten, but maybe that's enough to get started with my comment. That's a, that's, a, that's a great introduction, and I think I probably should have started with, um, I want to get the worst news over at the beginning, <laughs> and then we can start to talk about what we might do with that. Uh, um, I just sort of want to make a comment from what you said, and then come, I'll come back to your question, because I bet everybody in here uh, has looked sometime in the last week or so at some environmental indicator and gone, holy fuck. Yeah? yeah. And um, so that's a common experience that I think we're starting to have in a community. And I want to come back to your paper, Jim, because I've heard you talk about deep adaptation. Before I get into breaking together, I've heard you describe that paper as both a resignation letter <laughs> hmm. and a how. And I, I'm curious about you, you know, your background in corporate sustainability and where that how came from in terms of where we're at. What do you mean how? What how? That's how you described it <laughs> to me, like as a like something in your body. Oh, like a, oh, a howl. A howl. Owl. Not, an, not an owl. Ah, oh, no. okay. Hmm. Yeah, I first became an environmentalist. I don't know if you remember this, John. We've been friends from school when we were 12 or 13. I first became an environmentalist, I think, when I was about 14, and I had stickers on things, and I remember someone called me Mr. Greenpeace back then, I don't know if it was you, but, um, and I got a bit into Christianity briefly as well, uh, even thought I might be born again, and I was about 15 years old, and learning about the state of the world, particularly tropical deforestation, the abuse of indigenous peoples, but I, I I don't know how I was learning about that. Maybe great teachers. I, I don't quite remember. But there was that. And then, and then my sort of spiritual awakening, they came together. And I, back then, my personal story was 
okay, my, the world's going to be my church and my work is going to be my worship. And so it was kind of like non-negotiable part of my core being and identity to work flat out on environmental protection, conservation, and some kind of societal transformation for my... And, and looking back at it, maybe there was some lack of just self-acceptance and self-love just to chill out and have a nice life. You know, I was really pushing myself. Um, so that meant that um, I didn't... Okay, so when data started coming in, um, from maybe 2012 onwards, so 12 years ago, about things like the Siberian permafrost melting and releasing methane, and forest fires in the Arctic Circle, well, like the first time it was 30 degrees Celsius one summer in the Arctic Circle. It was around like some really weird stuff started appearing. And I'd studied climatology in my first year at university, and so I was like back in, in the early 90s, and I, I saw all that, and I thought, this is stuff that I shouldn't really be seeing in my lifetime. And so there was this fear, and I, I didn't really want to look at it. And I now realize it's because I wasn't just scared about um, what this might mean for life on Earth, human society, me, or my loved ones. I was also scared that the stories, deep stories in my own being about who I am and why I can live with myself were under threat as well. And that was part of the howl. I also became incredibly angry with myself and society that I had sort of repressed and suppressed my attention to these things. I had not been very radical, even though I knew about the radical critiques of capitalism and industrialism. Maybe like many of you, I'd been exposed to indigenous wisdom. As a teenager, I could, you know, quote Chief Seattle from the age of 13 or 14 about, you know, only when the last tree is cut and the last fish is fished that the white man remember or realize that you can't eat money. I knew all that stuff as a teenager, but I suppressed it thinking I need to be working with corporations, working with banks, working with governments, really trying to do as much as I can to create change. So there was some anger at how I'd not, I'd sort of suppressed something as well. So there was, all, there was a lot of stuff going on in me in the lead up to writing that paper and the decision to release it. Um, to, yeah, all of that added up to the howl, as I say, or the scream, like, ah, it was a... Um, um, maybe there were other bits in it as well, like in me. Um, but I mention that tonight because I think a lot of people, when they look at what's, what, what the latest, you know, global ocean temperatures or global air temperatures or the latest models are saying or what, what, what Jim Hansen, one of the world's top climatologists, is saying that we're, what we're headed for, like 10 degrees perhaps more than now, when we look at that, we're not, obviously, we're obviously not just looking at that. We're not just worried about that. We're worried about so much about ourselves and how we understand ourselves and our choices in life and who we love and, and um, yeah, so, so there's, the, like, there's the fear out there and then there's, there's a fear about who we are. Thanks, Tim, and I, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna circle around to that. I wanna ask you a couple more questions and then come back around to that to, to how we personally make this, but, um, when we start to look at what's going on, I think there's a number of ways that we step around it, uh, avoid it, um, get pulled into certain ways of understanding the world that deny it. And I want to outline a couple of them and, and have you speak to a couple of these. So one of them is the idea that we can use technology to get out of the situation that we created with technology. So, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about solar energy, I'm talking about um, 
electric vehicles. I'm talking about the push that's going on right now um, to go green as a solution to what's happening. And uh, I'd just love you to talk to that. Hmm. Yeah, so I spent uh, over two decades of my life uh, as what might be called a solutionist, um, both believing in market mechanisms, so the power of business and finance and consumer demand to create a transformation in society, to transition to a sustainable way of life. And so connected to that, I also believed in the power of new technology, uh, renewable energy generation and transmission and storage. Um, yeah, that was important to me. And I, I wasn't encouraged to think otherwise by NGOs, environmental experts, mass media. So I assumed that a transition was possible and also the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I thought they're, you know, the gospel on climate. And therefore I thought we had to maybe cut emissions over decades to avoid serious problems in 2100. That was kind of, and that's kind of like someone else's problem. So that was, that was how I felt for two decades. But looking at all of it closer, things um, appeared very differently. Um, like we all hear about how renewables are expanding massively and solar is cheaper than many other supplies, uh, many other forms of energy. Um, many of us are quite excited about uh, electric vehicles. They're cool now as well as they seem to be the inevitable future. But then if you look at the, the reality of it, over 80% of all energy used uh, in the world today is still fossil fuels. And so we, from the, the big data analysis, we're not seeing renewables displace fossil fuel use. We're seeing renewables add to the energy mix. We're seeing just increasing energy demand. So, um, and those people who then study these things say, well, we've known this. Like, um, people will keep using, they'll be keep using resources if there's a, if there's a demand for them. And so just because there's a new technology doesn't mean that you'll necessarily displace something. Um, often policy has to do that. In this case, to keep fossil fuels in the ground. That's not just going to happen through technological innovation. And I write about it in the book as the, the Jevons paradox. So he, he wrote about this in the 1800s. Um, looking at coal and innovations and in efficient use of coal just created more uses for coal rather than less coal extraction and consumption. So um, one of the, there's so much in the book and it's very difficult for me to remember everything but one thing that really sticks out for me is that if we, in Britain where I'm from, if all the current car fleet was electric that would use all the world's, the whole world's annual supply of cobalt just for the batteries. And then that's not then thinking about all the, the cobalt you might want in, in the recharging stuff. And then it's not looking at the amount of copper you'll need. And so, and then other people say, ah, oh, but we can get off. We don't necessarily have to have cobalt. So then you look, but then how much lithium is there in the world? And you, once you look at it, it's like, wow. Not only is it not actually possible, not only do you have to believe that human ingenuity will somehow very rapidly create batteries that are phenomenally better than now, you also have to decide that you don't care about where all those rare earth metals are in the ground right now. And some academics do care and they've analyzed it and that these are in some of the most pristine ecological places left on earth. So basically the green transition for rich people like us to keep living our lifestyles, driving and you know, just loving the way we life, live life now means that we've got to trash the planet for people who didn't actually cause the problem unlike us. 
So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, nonsense said by people promoting Green New Deal, Green Transition. Um, it's, it's actually, it's avoiding the fact that we, we can't do this and so therefore it's avoiding the fact that in modern industrial consumer societies need to power down and the only way that could be done in anything like a managed way is if the rich went first and they won't choose to and therefore they need to be forced to and therefore the only valid environmental attitude to have today is one of struggle including class struggle. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I watched the Four Corners here in Australia. I don't know if anyone else watched it. In the middle of 22, I think. Um, and they were talking about mining in the Tarkon. And the push of this Four, Pro Four Corners program was, well, if we want to save the world, we need the minerals underneath that forest. That was the push mm. of the Four Corners program. And Bob Brown was in it, in one of the few dissenting voices. But this is one of the things that scares me the most, uh, that there's going to be this push to save the world, in inverted commas, while, as you say, we trash it. So that's, that's one aspect of this. And of course, the other aspect that's more recently happened is it's happened since COVID. And... Um, when we saw the increase in government controls and what happens when a population gets really afraid uh, and a loss of confidence in um, a lot of the information that were given by previous organisations that we might have had confidence in, there now arises, and I have friends that are like this, saying that this whole thing around the climate is a hoax and it's designed by the government or the controlling leads to keep us afraid so that they may better control us. And uh, it's a complicated story because there's bits of truth and bits of not truth, but I I I'd love you to respond to that, Jim. So there are global elites and global corporations and they are untethered from any national interests, let alone community interests. And it is no surprise to know that any public disaster or public threat, they will come up with ideas of how to respond that further entrench their power, their status, um, and certainly don't challenge it. So in the book I call them the fake green globalists. They were the ones who benefited from helping speed us towards the precipice. So if we talk about the World Economic Forum, in the 80s, they decided they wanted economic globalization and neoliberalism, and they wanted it to be outside the UN system, so they made sure the WTO, the World Trade Organization, would be created with teeth to enforce trade liberalization, privatization, deregulation, so that their global companies could get ever bigger and they could get ever more rich and powerful. That trashed the environment more than it might have been otherwise. And now, I would say over the last, uh, particularly over the last five years, they've woken up to a very real ecological and climate crisis. And naturally, their ideas about what to do with it are wrong. You know, why are we listening to the people who made the problem about what we should do to respond to the problem? Sorry, Bill Gates, bugger off. <laughs> The problem is that then people who weren't really ne necessarily paying attention to this issue learn about it as an agenda from elites. 
So we've ended up with a dual crisis, I think. One is the climate and ecological crisis, which is getting ever more worse, and it's very easy to check the data on that, and a crisis of an illegitimate, overbearing, authoritarian, self-enriching response by global elites. So these two things can be true. Um, and some people, understandably, when faced with how scary the climate and ecological crisis seems, and with, as you say, the totally justified doubt about information sources and doubt about the credibility and ethics of those in authority, and I mean that broadly, I don't just mean politicians, I mean senior civil servants and top experts in, in you know, peak bodies, that very justifiable, reasonable doubt about the ethics and credibility of those people and those institutions means that there can be this sort of, combined with the fear and the worry about these stories of climate change, this sort of uh, openness to what I believe are conspiracy theories, like the theory that climate change is invented by Klaus Schwab in order to lock you in your neighborhood under a 15-minute city plan because for whatever reason. I mean, why, why, would, why would they want to do that anyway if there was no environmental crisis? If you look at it closely, you think, well, it doesn't really quite make sense. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm beginning to see it as um, an aspect of and an accelerator of societal collapse. The way that, in sociology, we call it elite panic. So whenever there's a disaster, there'll be an elite response to the disaster, which is primarily driven by their desire to appear in control and not trust us to work it out for ourselves. So the biggest disaster ever facing humanity is the climate and ecological crisis. And so there'll be the biggest ever elite panic from the global elites to manipulate us, control us, whatever. That absolutely is going to happen. But another aspect of the sort of fear-based response to this is to go into complete denial. And it's a lot easier to be angry at a boogeyman, a Bill Gates or a Klaus Schwab or whatever, this, than actually face the thing and, and think, well, what, what are we going to do about it? What's our agenda on this issue? Um, that takes a lot more work. It's a lot more difficult to work out what to do. You've got to be flexible, you've got to be learning, you've got to do trial and error, you'll have setbacks. It's a lot easier to share a TikTok video about Klaus Schwab being evil and then just forget about it. And into that context, um, the fossil fuel industry have seen a, a big opportunity. So in the UK, the Tufton Street PR agencies working with the fossil fuel industry very much have pushed the conspiracy theories um, and even leading to, to violence against green politicians in, in Glastonbury where I launched my book. It's, it's amazing isn't it, it's where the far right joins with the far left and became, become one and the same thing. Um, I just wanted to, to dress everyone for a second because I know when we go down this field, there can be that like tightening in the stomach uh, or spacing out maybe. It's a lot of very strong information to take in. And um, I'll say again what I said at the beginning, look at, we've got a full hall here of people who have their heads in the right place on this issue, I believe. And I'm hoping that we can do something as a community to meet more, whatever that means, but to face this together. Um, and, I, and I might sort of uh, start to head a slightly different direction now, Jim. Um, you wrote a lot of your book, or for six months you were writing your book with your father in hospice. 
And in your book, one of the uh, things that you said was you, you read in bits and you'd say to you, Jen, you've got to give them some hope. And uh, I, I, I loved your response. And, you know, what, what is it that we can hope for? And what you say to him? And what's your, what's your response to the question? So the conversation with Dad when he said you've got to give them some hope was um, spring 2019 and um, he, he stopped talking like that. So uh, yeah, but to answer your question, uh, what to hope for. Well, that can work at many levels. Like, what do I wish for, for my own life? What do I wish for, for the people I know? What do I wish for, for the human species? What do I wish for, for life on Earth? And what do I think is still possible, and what do I want to work towards? Um, and then with that, there's two ways. One is to think about outcomes, and the other is just to think about ways of being. So I, I wish for, and I sometimes work towards being more calm, kind, wise, creative, curious, giving. And I can be that now. And so I'm always a bit cautious about going into the whole hope about the future thing, because it can take us away from that, and it can invite us to actually compromise on that commitment to being kinder, wiser, loving, creative, caring, giving. Because we've got to get on and save the world, haven't we? You know, things have to be done. We have to do, to quote a climate activist line, do whatever it takes. Um, so I'm a bit nervous about this uh, taking us away from that how to be in this moment where it is a, not just a crisis, it's a tragedy. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm nervous to ever move away from that. So, and for me, lots of people of, who are into various spiritual traditions have helped me in that. And particularly Buddhism has been quite useful because Buddhism it brings attention to a lot of the discourse around hope is moving us away from the present moment and just how we are and how we are with reality and ourselves in the present moment. So the Buddha himself said, there's three kinds of people in the world. Those who are hopeful, those are hope, who are hopeless, and then there's those who've completely done away with hope in order to live hope-free, fully, in the moment, with what is. So, so all of that's there when I think about discourse or narrative around, around hope. To be more sort of straightforward on this, I don't know whether the human race can survive this century. I don't know. I don't know how much of modern civilization is going to survive. I don't know how much of it I think would be good to survive. Um, and I think I'm okay with not knowing the answers for the rest of my life. Um, I, I strongly believe in, in um, trying to seek out knowledge and encourage open debate and dialogue which is not shaped by fear and denial and vested interests and political games and that's what behind the philosophy behind my book so I, I guess I do have hope in or I have a belief or a, no I'd say I have a faith in enough of us humans to commune in dialogue and make good decisions for it to be worth trying that. It doesn't mean we do it at a planetary level and fix anything. But I still have faith that it's worth to try and do it in my sphere of influence. Yeah, I, I like that, particularly between faith and hope. I mean, just a question that 
you know, Michelle and I were talking about recently was, you know, how, how, how conflicting our hopes can be if the, the, the head can be this hope-making machine. On one level, uh, if we hope that this civilization keeps going as it is, which we may do sometimes, then we're, we're also wishing for the destruction of most life on Earth. On the other hand, uh, if we wish that that wouldn't go on, or hope that wouldn't go on, then that means certain things about us and the ones we love. And So hope is a question uh, that needs to come into focus, so thank you, Jim. Yeah, on that, I used to say I was interested in extending the glide, like a pilot does when the, uh, when the engines cut out, and I no longer say that, but at the same time, I'm also not wanting to put civilization into a nosedive, and that wouldn't be in my influence anyway. I just, where I can, soften the crash for me and people who will listen to me and I can work with and, and maybe plant seeds of something good, maybe learn how to dance in the crash site, have fun on the way. Um, I, yeah, I just think it's more about how to be in these times rather than justify what we do or don't do by some sort of calculation and theory about what can be saved where. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for all the courage you've shown over so many years, speaking out about so many things that so many people have trouble with. So, you know, thank you for me and probably for many people in the audience. But with that, uh, I want to hand it over. Um, some people may have questions and... Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Michael. I think I'm just curious. I'm not sure if everyone here fully knows about your book and your content and your work. I'm sure we're making an assumption they do. But I'm wondering if you would have mind just giving a quick update, a snapshot of where we are right now globally. Um, from your perspective, just a couple of minutes of this is where we are, this is my perspective, and this is what I think is happening. That could be really helpful, I think. I would appreciate it to hear from you directly. Thank you. Yeah, okay. um, so much has happened since I finished writing the book in April last year with the world's climate. It just started beginning uh, around March last year. So just in the last six months, the global average temperature is 1.7 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. Um, pre-industrial level is assessed at around 13.8 Celsius. So that gives you a, a sense of proportion. But the other thing to think of is that in 2022, the, according to certain data sets, the average global temperature was 1.2 Celsius. So, um, yeah, we're, we're looking at a, a 0.5 Celsius rise in about a year, and the paleontological studies, for example, the Antarctic ice core, show that the world did heat up in the past about that much at times, over year, about 500 years, sometimes a bit more, never really much less. So just in the last year, we've seen a temperature spike that, if our science is correct, would normally be 500 years. And the problem with climate change is ecosystems and agriculture coping with speed of change. So when you hear people say, oh, well, the world's climate changed before, don't worry, you're just living in fear. Um, but from the science that we have, it's never changed this fast. And we, we, we had a problem even before. So in my book, I write about the climate problem in one of the chapters as well, um, but it's even worse now. So I'm in a process of wondering just how bad it's going to get, um, how soon and in what ways. For example, the best modeling in the world done by EASA in Vienna using the biggest data sets and computers and so on, has calculated that within going past 1.5 Celsius above pre-industrial levels, within three years of that, we'll have a multi-breadbasket failure for maize. So that's basically the, the international trade in maize is dependent on a handful of places that are exporters. 
And because of the disruption to the jet streams that will come, you'll then see uh, disruption in agricultural production in a number of key regions. And they also said like, within four or five years for, for wheat. Um, and there are knock-on effects of all of that. Um, and of course, that's not happening in isolation. There's damage to other crops as well from a more erratic environment, more erratic weather. So, um, yeah, what does this mean? I think we could just, in the coming Northern Hemisphere summer, see terrible damage to crops, and because of the way that the price of staples is influenced through markets and commodities traders and so on, we could see some horrendous uh, price inflation for basic foodstuffs. And we know that, you know, why was there an Arab Spring in 2011? There was analysis that it was because there was a 10% a jump very, very quickly in, in the price of, of wheat. And that kicked off a number of uh, protests. So this is the thing in complex systems, these initial disruptions can end up with political disruption. So, my book argues that societies are already breaking down and that in that context it helps to understand that they are, to recognize how painful and shocking and worrying and confusing, confusing that is, but then it suggests that we can break together, not apart, if we, find, if we allow ourselves to talk about what to do. And so it's an invitation to normalize the awareness that this is what's happening and so let's talk about it and try to do things to make things better in this disturbing context. But since then, um, yeah, I'm, I have tension in, in the stomach here to the left talking about it and, and here in my throat. I, I like my life. I'm enjoying visiting Australia. I like my life where I live now. I like the fact that I'm doing an organic farm school in Bali. Um, and when I see just quite how fast things are moving, it's like, um, I do wonder if I'm in denial. I do wonder whether I'm fully living what I just talked about, which is being in the now, or whether I'm still very attached to stories of contribution and uh, somehow succeeding. Um, yeah, I'm, I would say I'm a little bit scared right now. Uh. Thank, thanks, Jim. Um, what I would take issue with some of the things you said about the technology. Um, I would completely agree with you that we are in the middle of collapse, a collapse that can't be avoided, no matter what we do with technology. But it seems to me there are, there are things we can do other than just wallow in the, in the trauma. You know, we can, there's things we can do to make it less bad, like not digging any more coal out of the ground. There's things we can do to make the, the disasters less impactful, like not building on floodplains, for example. And there's, and there's things we can do to be ready for disasters like building community resilience and, and building better mechanisms for responding because we know that we know the government and the agencies won't from the last set of floods. So mm -hmm. how do you how do we deal with this point of not getting stuck in wallowing in the trauma and actually do the things to make the the descent less painful? Um, can I rephrase your question about not getting stuck in the despair rather than trauma? Or we, unless you were choosing trauma for a reason? Just because it's an overused word at the moment. Okay, yeah. Well, we'll um, despair. Yeah. Um, being, if I understand despair as a state of massive grief and sadness and a sense of I don't know what to do and nothing makes sense anymore 
and therefore there's no energy in me to get up and do anything. So the way that despair can then become even clinical depression, if you're thinking about that, then in that state, you're unlikely to go out and um, campaign against a coal mine or um, do something according to whatever might be the plan um, to reduce impact in the world. What I've understood is that people don't stay in that state for that long and when they come out of that state they can either go into reconstructing self like ego affirmation, identity affirmation, you just go back and you, you adopt stories that make you numb and tougher to reality but there's also another way of responding um, which I know so many people have responded this way and maybe Michael you can speak to this where that despair is transformative and has a positive disintegration of their old priorities, identity, worldview, and they become radicalized. And it seems that's what happened to so many people who then joined and led Extinction Rebellion, that the despair, it was a dark place for them, but then they emerged with a different set of priorities and a commitment to truth, courageous truth and love. And, um, and if we're talking about social change, then we also need to talk about political change and how that happens. And that doesn't happen by us in our jobs or private lives, sort of staying positive and recycling and shopping differently and investing differently and so on. I actually see it might be more powerful if more of us hit rock bottom and become revolutionaries as a result. Um, so because uh, I see it as a revolutionary moment um, and I see a lot of people are hitting rock bottom with nothing to do with climate because of the implications of this you know we've got I'll give you one stat that I learned the other day uh, in the UK four out of ten young parents um, have skipped a meal in order to feed their kids last year um, so there are people who are fucking angry and so they should be and so let's uh, let's just connect with that like um, so I, I don't want to see this as just an environmental topic over here that we need to stay positive about. This, if you, if, if you recognize that modern societies are breaking down, then that is a fundamental condemnation of the entire culture and systems that destroy life on earth and fucked everything up. And therefore we should be angry and therefore we should hit despair and therefore we can emerge in a new way. Um, so it should be fundamentally radicalizing, and for so many people it is. So this argument that it, it, it creates apathy, my, I've only met a few people who, where they don't want to do anything because, oh, it's too late anyway. And if I asked them about that, they weren't environmentalists before anyway, they weren't doing anything anyway. And then if I asked, well, when is it going to go wrong? They don't really quite know, and then, and they think, and then you, you, feel, you find out they haven't really had much of an existential crisis from this. Um, so they're kind of being numb to it, and that's their defense mechanism. So I, I don't, quite not to, don't quite know what to do with, when I meet such people, I do say, well, there's this other way of thinking, which is, doesn't it make you want to live differently from now on. Um, so yeah, I... The other thing I would say on this issue of motivation and agency and activism and how do we change things is that there is research on it. And so, so many of the uh, mainstream environmentalists who say we must stay optimistic, positive, give people hope, are not basing that on on analysis, on psychology or political science. They're saying it as, a, as projection. They're saying it because they're scared of their own despair and they're avoiding it. And I, why do I say that? That sounds a bit judgmental, because I've met these people and I was one of them. 
and I keep meeting these people, they're the, the confident leaders in environmentalism and climate action, and it's like they don't want to go there because they don't want to experience despair, so they keep saying, I need to keep you all happy and positive. Uh, hi Jim, my name is Funny Skill, I'm from Geelong, recently moved to Queensland. And my question uh, is really about, I'm hoping you can help me understand my role in this great play of humanity, so I think of it. Um, and uh, it's partly informed by a book by Dick Van Hammer's called um, Peace of the World We Have. And my understanding is that it seems likely to me that if we can learn how to be at peace with the world we have, just as it is, then we're more likely to be able to make wise choices about how to be in action for ourselves and what our family are. And we know that's a function of a place on peace. I don't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, sorry, but do you get to the question? Here's what I'm talking about. 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 To deal with any reality, no matter how difficult, no matter how trying, help people to understand the reason why we are. And the second part is: Are we going to? Is it likely we will have a financial collapse before we have a? Uh, that's based on this huge debt that we've created, uh, or and that's good, that will that happen before we have real impacts from climate change? I know we're having some impacts, but I'm on serious impacts. So, two part question. I appreciate it. I love your work, Jim. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you. I, I'm very pleased to hear you're reading Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, I recently went to a Plum Village retreat in Bali, and that was a privilege talking to some of the monks. And uh, anger, fear, any difficult emotion can be natural, rational, and functional, or not. Um, it can be useful information and motivate us, or it can it can block, it can distract, it can undermine us. So the crucial issue is always. The big fancy word in Buddhism or mindfulness is equanimity, but that ability to notice what's happening in us, and notice if we're uh, craving or um, disliking, pushing away certain thoughts and feelings and certain emotions. So um, we certainly need more equanimity in us and each other, and we can do all manner of things that have been known for thousands of years about how to cultivate that in each other. And if we don't have that, I think any thinky-thinky answers to the questions you pose are somewhat like irrelevant, because we're coming at it with this subconscious need to affirm ourselves and our stories of the world in order to somehow moderate an emotion in us. Um, so yeah, starting your question with um, Thich Nhat Hanh, I'm fully into that. Um, but being at peace in the world means, for me, being equ equanimous with what is, including the fact that thing, there's going to be horrific suffering and uh, unnecessary suffering and human-caused in injustice and destruction for the rest of our lives. It's just part of it, that reality. And our desire to fight back and do something about that, which involves anger as well as peaceful resolve, is also just part of life. Um, so, on to the question of whether financial collapse will occur before. Um, so it's all to do with, you know, who and where, you know. Um, there's good evidence to say that the, 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 the war in Syria is related to the, seven, the, wor the worst drought for 700 years not just foreign policies of, of certain countries. So, you know, huge carnage there, lives unend upended. Um, the people here who live in Lismore and other areas where you've had your lives upended and maybe some of you have lost your houses and, or, and therefore also your community, 
or maybe you discover new community through the disaster. I mean, so it's difficult to answer your question because there could also be sporadic localized financial collapses um, rather than a global total financial collapse everywhere. So, and climate impacts could trigger a problem with the insurance markets, which might then spook the financial markets, which might therefore then suddenly lead to a retraction of credit for a particular part of the world, you know, just pick one, you know, Latin America, Africa, Australia, who knows? I'm not going to pretend to, to predict any of that. So for me, all of this gets worse, and yes, I think for where I've chosen to live, my most immediate threat to my own life and, the, uh, and well-being would be a financial collapse, and therefore I'm quite happy that I'm working on finding ways of being useful and valuable to the local community where I live in Bali if suddenly the financial system went down or just my bit of it, you know, if just the, my bank in the UK and my bank in Indonesia collapsed. At least I'm involved in a system of people, there are relationships, I'm valuable to them, we know each other, we're productive, we're growing food, we're helping other people grow food. So, so yeah, I've certainly made a choice where I can to do something which will help help me and is also a bit of fun now. So, yeah, I would encourage you and other people to think, okay, how could I be okay if, I don't know, the US dollar collapsed tomorrow? How could I be okay if the Australian dollar collapsed next year? Like, and, and absolutely, that's a wonderful framework to have a conversation about and then do something about it. It might not be the case. It might be that fires sweep through this region and the Australian dollar's on an all-time high. <laughs> I don't know. My heart is informing me that I'm more anxious about public speaking than climate change. <laughs> um, we, we can do this transition individually. Um, we can feel the fear and the, the despair and move through it into a state of being as you talk about. And we can do that as a collective group. Um, what does a fearless society look like? Well, maybe a fearless society looks like a society where disease, suffering, death, exclusion from the group, a possible lack of respect from others, and all these things that we might be scared about don't exist. Um, so maybe many indigenous societies were in some way closer to fearless societies because we, uh, I've grown up in a society where the whole system made me think that I was unsafe, insecure, needed to strive, needed to compete, needed to acquire, own, control, be successful. Um, and if I didn't strive, I wasn't safe. So, so I know at least the society I grew up in is the opposite of a, of, a, of a fearless society. But the other thought that comes to mind is that, well, fear is natural. You know, fear is a useful emotion. And so the idea of valorizing, praising, upholding the idea that we want to be individually or collectively free of fear, well, that's, what is that saying of us? We are human animals, and fear is natural, rational, and functional. It's just we maybe have created systems that have created 
unnecessary fear, unnecessary anxiety. And I know the ones that have been caused in me through growing up in an industrial consumer society where all this sense of need to compete and acquire, control, dominate. But so, um, so rather than a fearless society, I would love to think about how it might look to live in a hope-free society. Where we live for things other than stories about what we're going to achieve one day. Just how are we going to be with each other now? Yeah, I don't know if you've heard of my organization, Local Futures. We've been promoting what we call localization for the last 30 years. And I think from everything you're saying, that you'd be supportive of that, Jen. So for me, the, the way forward right now is to change the attitude. We and encourage everywhere that people connect with each other, the deep healing that comes from that, and focus on water and food security by building up local food economies. Do you agree with all of that, or do you disagree with that, then, Jen? Okay. My answer is yes and. I agree with all of that and it also might not work. And so my invitation is that we do these things because we believe them to be right, because they're beautiful to do in the moment and they might help. But um, if we are garden beds are way better than bunkers, as we deal with our terror or anxiety, uh, currently anxiety, maybe future terror. But um, if we're attached to our story of our garden beds somehow saving us, then, then that might not be such a good idea. There needs to be all the work that you've described, but then think it might not work, and also think where is it limited? So. Um, yeah, I mean, someone on my course uh, last week, a uh, leading permaculture organization in Queensland, and uh, one of the floods just washed away everything they've been doing for the last 10 years. So we've got to... So she's learned quite a lot from that, and that's been through quite a lot of suffering in that context. So um, if you have a deeper resolve that you're doing things because you believe them to be right, and I think you do because it comes from this faith that we can be a we society, not a me society, then you'll keep going no matter what setbacks. And so that I think that deeper resolve is, is really important. Hello, Jim. My name's Seth. I call myself Peter Walker and I started a thing called Planet Radio to try to bring this information back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, Protestantizing was not all that useful. And uh, then began a thing called The Village and Village Matrix to bring people together face to face and know each other. Um, one of the things that, that I faced in that, and I want to be interested in the comment uh, and your perspective, is that there doesn't seem to be a simple solution, there doesn't seem to be any solution, uh, and that seems to me to be based around a kind of hedonism that occurs even when you bring people together around serious matters. That when they come together around those serious matters, unless they feel there's something they can actually do, they tend to flip back to, oh, I will just enjoy ourselves. And that's been troubling me now for over a decade um, and doesn't seem to be well answered by the stay in a place of no hope mm -hmm. and just live your life, mm -hmm. as far as I can see. I'd love to hear your commentary on that.
Okay, I'll try and say this without any sense of that I'm transgressing and therefore stealing myself for a transgression and therefore coming across somehow a bit angry. Environmentalism in the West has been the interest of the middle classes and therefore it's always been about how we with our better income and better knowledge get more people like us to care more about the future generations and this that and the other. So that hasn't worked. The interesting thing about being in a, a situation of, of societal collapse, which most of us here aren't really experiencing much in our own lives, is that other people are. And so if we want to be community activists, we need to go and help the people who are suffering already. And you do not have to explain to them that there's a problem about somewhere else in the world, for other people, in the future, whatever. They are suffering right now. So to go back to the previous questioner, then you're... You're suffering right now. Your bills are going through the roof. You can't afford to get to your kids to school on the bus or whatever. It's all just being a nightmare. You, how can you possibly live this way? Yes, it's because of this, and it's going to get worse. They're lying to you that somehow, if you vote for them or whatever, it's going to get better. It's not. It's global. It's going to get worse. And to work from that reality, if you want to be involved in, in, in sort of like broad-based political social change efforts, um, it's also to get out of the green box and see where are there already um, movements of people rebelling and wanting to see change. And that is happening. There is a lot of alienation and anger because of what's perceived to be the corrupt merger of corporate and state power using a public health crisis to enrich the elites through the corrupt awarding of contracts for PPE, protective equipment, for signing over billions of dollars to pharmaceutical companies for products that didn't actually work. I mean, there, there is a lot of anger globally on this. And so if you're, if you're a greenie saying, yeah, we need revolutionary change, and you're just ignoring that thing that's growing and just saying, oh, they look a bit right-wing and yucky and they don't, they're, they're believing conspiracies about climate, then you're not really serious about being involved in any kind of proper political change. You're just talking about, oh, let's get a bit of money to talk to a few more middle-class people about a bit more stuff on a bit more green stuff. It doesn't work. It's the first thing. The second thing is we're not going to see the rich world it's very unlikely we're going to see the rich world vote in a government that will say we're going to reduce your quality of living or standard of life. So if you really want to see degrowth in the West, you should support anti-imperialist revolutionary movements in the global South who will then club together and say, sorry, you're not having our oil. Sorry, you're not, you're not having our bananas. And are you getting many middle-class Greens in Australia or the UK or wherever talking about, no, we should support revolu anti-imperialist revolutionaries in the South to force us to degrow? Because, look, we haven't done it, have we? <laughs> and we're not going to. So um, I find the conversation of Western environmentalists mostly bullshit. And that's all explained in my book in far more constructive, well-referenced ways than what I just did. Um, this is probably a very stupid question, but is there no way we can make it very attractive to billionaires to share their wealth with people who are suffering? So the fact we have billionaires is uh, one indicator that we have extreme wealth inequality and therefore extreme inequalities of power. And the history of 
analysis of the, the, the history of civilizational collapse is that's one of the indicators that when there's such extreme inequality, the, the people who control society, and there are new ways to do that with visibility filtering, shadow banning, and all sorts, the people who control society are so disconnected from what's really happening that then the wise choices aren't made and society collapses. Um, I don't want to spend any time trying to think how to get billionaires to share. Um, I just, I sometimes feel a little bit better that maybe they've just got further to fall than the rest of us. Um, and for me, this is the silver lining in societal collapse. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I would even change the language. I mean, you, I'd, I'd have a conversation with like, how do we, how do we mobilize to take more power back rather than ask rich people to share more? And so in the, in the book, I call it a great reclamation, which is like, where, where, where in our local community can we reclaim more power for our community? And if, so if we talk about billionaires, we're kind of making it out there somewhere, and it takes us away from sort of the practical, like, like what, what are the assets around here that are commonly owned or could be commonly owned, or at least Whoa! locally owned? And, um, and then play with just taking them back without permission, because that's what's going to happen as things collapse, and it's already happening in some places. So as things collapse, just get in there and take the resources you need and de declare it as part of a great reclamation in the era of societal collapse. Um, so one thing about hanging out with Jen for a while is a little bit of an earthquake. And, um, but I think this is, these are the times I think we're living in. It, it's a sort of hard look in a mirror and Jen, again, I just want to say thank you. Uh, someone's got to come and say these truths. And I, I do think that the people who end up speaking the truths are the people that get picked on the most. And we need to support our truth tellers. Uh, Julian Assange being one of them. Uh, so, um, Jen, just a uh, big thank you. Uh, for turning up and being so clear. Yeah, t t uh, thank you. And um, this guy sold his house after he read my paper. And uh, so that's some despair and some positive disintegration. But um, I recommend you see his film if you haven't already, because it's certainly worth... Was it worth, was it worth the... Uh... Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So you... Living in the time you, you, of dying, you, you, you haven't seen it. So you, yeah. you don't hold it against me then, that you're homeless. <laughs> happy, very happy to have made that film. My highlight. There you highlight. go. Brave man, eh? Yeah. Let's hear it for Michael. So that's it. Let's, uh, let's just say a big thank you, Jim, again. Thank you.